Thanks. So I'm recording and it'll be on our YouTube website. The first part one is already posted and it's had nine views so far. So I think people that weren't able to stay the whole time or that had to miss it for some reason have had the opportunity to watch it. This one will get up on the YouTube channel late today or tomorrow so people can watch it before part three on Wednesday, um, if need be. Um, we will be going into breakout rooms as well at some point today, and I'm going to try and sort those out while Anita does the first part of her presentation. If you have any questions, feel free to unmute or to type them in the chat, and I'll let Anita get started. Hey, everyone. Uh, welcome back to the slide. So thank you very much for joining uh, me again this morning um, and uh, for the for a bit of the afternoon as well. And I look forward to really diving into um, the assessment part of um, the workshop. So today we'll be covering a lot of the assessment tools and screening tools specific to uh, perceptual impairments. And, um, and we'll have some opportunities during the breakout rooms to try these tools. So, um, and so I encourage you to take that opportunity to try things out. And then really also for those of you who are familiar with these tools that will be presented to really engage in discussion after as to, you know, how, how have your experiences been to apply these tools in clinical practice? Um, and so, and what have been like sort of facilitators or barriers that you've encountered as well. So we'll, we'll uh, hopefully have lots of discussion and lots of time for uh, engagement questions uh, and, and discussions. So thank you. I'll uh, get started. So as I said today, um, we'll be looking at screening and assessment for both visual perception and USN. Uh, we'll look at very quickly the psychometric properties of these tools, and then really getting some time to discuss the clinical applicability of the tools, which is where, you know, I really would enjoy uh, getting some of your input and experiences as well. I can share some of mine as well. Uh, we'll have the hands-on experiences with uh, the MVPT, the line bisection, behavioral and attention test, and we can address any questions that you have as well. So that will be pretty much what we'd like to cover today. I, I, I saw that there were some questions regarding the line bisection test, and so I'll happy, I'm very happy to address them, uh, those specific questions as well when we get to that point. Uh, just what I wanted to cover just before we get started is just, you know, a few questions that were um, asked uh, in yesterday's or rather in the Tuesday session, the first day one session in regards to really being able to discriminate between um, motor neglect, uh, vis uh, personal neglect specifically and proprioception. And, um, and so I just wanted to post this slide just as a bit more information and just to also highlight that clinically, you know, it could be quite uh, a bit confusing in terms of really trying to discriminate the challenge, you know, the differences between these impairments. And so I hope this slide will help illustrate or just sort of draw uh, or clarify some of the uh, questions. Um, so just, you know, just to overview quickly in, in terms of motor neglect or a more intentional neglect, this is really, you know, as we see here as an output issue. Um, and so, you know, clients who have motor neglect have normal visual input or normal visual processing, right? So um, that's all intact. Uh, however, you know, what they present uh, in terms of this motor issue is that um, it's, it, it tends to mimic hemiplegia as if they are not able to use their, um, their uh, affected side, but in fact, they actually have normal motor and sensory input. Um, and so, uh, but what happens is that they just demonstrate a lack of use or underuse of that affected side um, very spontaneously uh, in activities that they would typically use that, that affected side, um, even, even though they're aware of you know, the fact that they need to be using that affected side. So for instance, when we look at bimanual tasks, like if we get these clients to try to open a bottle or clap their hands um, uh, or button their shirt, they will uh, demonstrate an underuse of that affected side um, in, in tasks that typically would use both hands. Um, you know, again, you know, I gave the example of, uh, you know, they would have a decreased uh, left arm use uh, spontaneously as compared to their right arm while they're ambulating. Um, however, if we do bring their attention to this, uh, to, to this lack of use uh, of their affected limb, they're actually able to quickly improve their performance uh, when their attention is drawn to the fact that they're not using that limb. Um, so even for instance, if they receive feedback with a mirror, they can quickly adjust and improve their performance because they are in fact aware of that uh, affected side. 
Um, and so, uh, and they can even actually have normal or close to normal performance when provided with verbal cueing as they're performing a task for them to actually incorporate at their uh, affected side. So, um, you know, it, it's when they're doing activities more spontaneously is when they actually start to sort of underuse or um, uh, just they, they're not their motor output seems to be affected. Um, whereas personal neglect is very different. This is where there's definitely a problem that we see in terms of uh, sensory input that they're receiving. Uh, well, not the sensory input, but rather the processing that's happening. So there's a there's an issue in terms of input and processing of information, um, and uh, therefore they're not actually attending to any sensory stimuli or some of the sensory stimuli that they're receiving, either uh, visual uh, sensory stimuli, tactile, auditory on their affected side. So this is again where we would see them uh, poorly positioned uh, in a chair. Uh, they they completely ignore uh, one side of their uh, their affected side or their affected side that uh, been, has been affected by the stroke. Um, so they don't uh, incorporate that that side in terms of dressing. They uh, they don't even bathe that one side of their body, and so they really essentially ignore that side. And even when they're given uh, verbal cueing, um, it, it requires lots of verbal cueing for them to really start to incorporate um, that affected side. They really, really even need, you know, hand over hand um, to really bring their attention to that affected side. Um, and then in the end, uh, you know, for them to be able to actually incorporate their affected side, they need which is what we'll dive into in uh, day three is that intellectual override. Basically, they need to be told that they cannot trust their eyes uh, whatever they see in terms of their visual input, um, in terms of, you know, when they scan an environment, uh, they need to sort of use their intellect to override um, whatever they see with their eyes uh, so that they can't really trust, um, you know, the, that, the, the vision that they have. Um, and in fact, that there's a lot of their environment that they're actually emitting um, and that they, you know, they really need to use that, um, that intellect to compensate. And then finally, proprioception. I know I had a few questions about that. It's really, again, it's really looking at, you know, the body's awareness of their body, of their position in space, um, using receptors either in the skin, muscle, or joint. And it's really without that visual input, right? So, um, you know, here we often, when we test for, a vision, for proprioception, we see whether a client could stand on one foot while looking straight. So without using their vision, are they able to get a sense of, you know, their body's position in space um, with Without that input. Um, so then they tend to have difficulties going up and down stairs, riding a bike, uh, you know, they're not able to really sense the amount of force that they need to uh, apply to that pedal. Um, and so that becomes, that's where proprioception becomes challenging. So, you know, again, uh, just by understanding the, the sort of um, the impairments and, you know, the underlying cause uh, and just the characteristics of these impairments, it'll, you know, really help us uh, in terms of investigating really what is the cause um, for certain, you know, presentation, clinical presentations that we see. So when a client is poorly positioned, you know, we really need to investigate and see, you know, and rule out uh, what are possible reasons uh, that could be causing this and reason and, and, you know, what's actually intact for the client. So hopefully this slide will help illustrate and explain a bit more about those questions that you had earlier. So now moving forward to today's um, session. Uh, and again, if there's any more questions, feel free to ask, but um, and, and we unmute or ask in the chat. But now when we move for today's session, we want to focus in on really choosing um, that right screening tool and assessment tool to assess for uh, visual perception, uh, as well as USN. So what we need to first ask ourselves is really what is that main purpose in assessment? Um, are we looking to screen specifically or are we looking to assess? Um, and so that's really important because of course, the characteristics of these tools will be very different if it's a, if it's identified as a screening tool versus assess. And so to quickly you know, discriminate, basically a screening tool is meant to really uh, identify or detect the presence of a, a particular impairment, right? Um, that's all you're going to do and you'll be able to answer the question, yes, no, is there the presence or not of vision, visual perception or USN present in this client. Um, so that's pretty much, it's really detection. And assessment on the other hand is really where you're trying to determine the extent of um, the, the impairment. So what's the severity, you know, uh, what's the extent, is it mild, moderate or severe? Um, you're trying to sort of 
discriminate between perhaps like the type of hemispace that's being affected. So you're really assessing in, in much more detail. And the um, characteristics of these assessment tools is that you could then use, uh, you can then repeat that assessment tool to see whether, um, you know, there has been any improvement in the extent of that, of that impairment. Um, and you'll be able to document that uh, change that resulted um, just from spontaneous recovery or from um, improvements due to treatment and challenges that you're providing. So it's really important to make sure that you're using the right tool when assessing clients, um, use, you know, choosing to use the screening tool when you're, you're sort of, um, you know, you have a hunch or a clinical uh, suspicion that there, there could be a presence of neglect, you would then proceed with a screening tool. Uh, but then when you're confirmed or when you're, uh, when you're um, confident that there is a presence of neglect, at that point, you can then proceed with an assessment tool to you know, really uh, identify the extent of the impairment. We also wanna, of course, look at the psychometric properties of the tool. And so you know, I'll cover that um, in the, the coming slides on each of the tools and looking at its reliability, validity, and responsiveness to change. And uh, of course, you want to make sure you want to examine the content of the tool, um, how appropriate it is for uh, clients. You know, really understanding. You know, what are the what are the actual physical and functional requirements that a, a client needs to have in order to um, to undergo the assessment uh, and uh, screening, and uh, in order to be for it to be done in a standardized fashion. Uh, any cognitive requirements, as well as you know, how relevant is this tool for the patient? You know, that's something that needs to be discussed with the patient. Um, its relevance, its meaningfulness, and, and, and so forth. How much time? So time is an important factor. Um, you know, how much time does it take to administer the tool and scoring? And that's often something that guides our choice with um, uh, the types of tools that we choose for, um, for our practice. The cost, of course, and the training that's required, um, and definitely the clinical re uh, relevance. Um, when we think about manager and colleague buy-in, um, here where it's more like, you know, do we really feel like the, um, you know, the time that it takes to assess this, uh, you know, to administer this tool, does it really, uh, really uh, detect the presence of that impairment, or does it really uh, assess the extent of the impairment? Um, you know, is it worthwhile the time that it takes to assess? It's really having that buy-in um, to really adopt that best practice tool or um, best practice assessment tool. Really, um, you know, having that manager buy-in and support is important um, because, of course, you know, the assessment tools that we have available to us in clinical practice is often, um, you know, uh, relative to, you know, is there buy-in from colleagues or managers to actually use the tools, right? Um, that's also what guides our, our decision-making as to whether to use an assessment tool or not. And then finally, the construct being measured, you know, you want to really make, make sure that um, you know, you're very clear on what are the specific constructs that you're trying to assess or the domains that you're trying to assess and making sure you choose the right tool that really truly assesses those specific um, domains or constructs um, and that you're, you know, so that you, you really assess what you're meant to assess. So those are just things to consider. Of course, you know, um, you know, in making sure that we're evidence-based in terms of our decision-making for screening and assessment, you really want to look at, you know, these for bubbles, you know, making sure that you have the sufficient expertise or training for uh, when choosing a tool, the resources, so the tool needs to be available, of course, in your practice setting, um, the research evidence behind, you know, that tool uh, is very important as well. And then, as, of course, patient preferences um, and, uh, you know, their input in deciding whether to use an assessment or intervention. But as you can imagine, imagine a lot of there are a lot of contextual factors that will influence that decision making. So it could be, you know, whether there's support or, um, the, you know, an organizational culture to use um, uh, best tools that have been recommended by best practices, um, whether there's support from managers, whether there's a sufficient time available at your practice setting for assessment and, and, and sort of the value of that. Um, there are many factors that can influence your decision making in regards to what you choose for assessment and treatment. So uh, these are these the next coming slides are more of a review of um, the psychometric properties that are important to consider for um, uh, when choosing an assessment tool. Um, so I've already covered screening and assessment, but in terms of psychometric properties, of course, reliability reliability again looks at the uh, the fact of whether the measure is in fact repeatable or stable, um, and you know whether you can get the score. Uh, 
you know, when administering the scale at, at two occasions, uh, whether it remains consistent between um, multiple raters or even within the same rater. So that's something that you want to make sure that the tool has. And then internal consistency really looks at the items of the tool and do they actually measure the same characteristic, right? So that's something very important to consider, um, you know, when choosing an assessment tool. In terms of validity, again, we want to make sure that even if a tool is very reliable, we want to make sure that the tool actually measures what it's meant to measure, what it's supposed to measure. So, um, you know, that's, you know, that so that the tool needs to have appropriate face validity, um, you know, so for both for the person administering the test, but also the, the client receiving the test, that it should look like it's meant to measure visual perception if that's exactly what it's measuring. Um, that, you know, the, the actual items are actually uh, represented or there's there they represent the specific context or the the co the construct that's being measured so that's the really content validity looking at um the fact that you know if if a, a visual perceptual tool is looking at visual discrimination it in fact really measures um you know what 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 entails visual discrimination and how do we assess those different components so it's all incorporated in that assessment tool uh, construct validity, it's really looking at, you know, if we look at a, another um, tool that assesses visual perception, you know, does it really, uh, can we um, uh, obtain the similar results? And so, uh, you know, or do these two tools measure the similar construct? And so that's something that could be tested um, uh, using various statistics. Criteria and validity is really looking at, you know, how well the assessment tool really measures up to a gold standard. And so, you know, if you look at the best practice of, um, you know, really measuring, say, for instance, um, blood pressure, you know, if you look at a doctor's office measurement versus the arm cuff at the pharmacy, you know, that would be, you know, really comparing um, two ways of measuring blood pressure uh, and comparing it with the gold standard. And then finally, predictive validity is also, you um, looking at, you know, how well can that tool predict uh, a certain outcome. So, you know, we look at the MVPT and its ability to uh, predict driving ability. And so that would be an example of uh, a tool's ability to really predict a certain uh, event or outcome. And then finally, responsiveness. And so this is, again, another important feature of an assessment tool, but really looking at that uh, tool's ability to detect um, clinically important differences uh, in a client based on following treatment or even through spontaneous recovery over time. And so this is, uh, again, an important feature that needs to be, that usually is included and assessed for um, in terms of a, um, in, in assessment tools, but this is not a feature definitely that you would see in a screening. So uh, we looked last uh, last um, on day one in regards to barriers and facilitators, but this is just another study uh, by Van Cleff and colleagues that was done looking at specific uh, barriers and facilitators to adopting best practices specifically to visual perceptual screening and assessment. And so, um, you know, this is just was documented um, by this um, uh, this group of colleagues uh, in the, the group that they assessed, but they basically felt that, um, so clinicians had expressed that, uh, you know, they, they expressed or perceived that they had a lack of clarity about visual perception, um, you know, and in terms of really assessing that sensory visual function versus something more higher level. When we look at visual discrimination, visual scanning, and other more visual perceptual higher level skills, um, you know, they weren't really clear on how to sort of discriminate or, you know, assess the two. Uh, and so sometimes, you know, there seems to be a lack of, of sort of understanding of uh, around visual perception uh, in general and how to approach screening and assessment. And so that this often led to inaccurate screening and miscases. cases. Um, sometimes there was a lack of training available for uh, visual perceptual screening um, that, you know, that there was an unawareness of what were the existing uh, treatments to follow up with. And so that led to a lack of assessment. Um, that they, you know, perhaps was a lack of time. And this is, I think, something that was mentioned um, during day one by um, uh, one of the clinicians is that, you know, there seems to be a lack of time for really use of standardized measures um, to assess for uh, visual perception uh, for many multiple reasons, but the here are ones that were mentioned in the article. And um, it could also be that, you know, again, either that uh, it's very difficult to follow up clients across the continuum of care, um, you know, that perhaps um, some of the tools are not, have been designed in a way that they're not completely appropriate for assessment and they don't account for uh, very common um, um, 
stroke sequelae like aphasia or cognition, um, or they're not very practical. There's many items and it's too lengthy. So there's multiple factors that can impact uh, that can impact um, one's ability or one's um, willingness to adopt best practices for uh, visual perception screening and assessment. So when we dive into screening per se, and so right now I'm gonna focus in on screening for USN specifically. Um, what we found in the literature in fact is that um, there are multiple tools to assess visual perception assessment um, out there. And there's some of them actually being even shortened to make them into sort of quick, uh, quick and easy uh, assessment tools, but there in fact has not been really any screening tools specifically developed to, to screen for visual perception. Um, and perhaps this is maybe an area that's often, well, that requires more research, but also is an area that, um, you know, uh, perhaps visual perception is more often screened through functional observation or assessment, uh, of functional observation or evaluation, um, and then, then pursued with an actual uh, assessment tool. But, um, but for the screening of USN, there are multiple tools that are out there. Um, and so we're gonna talk about the line bisection test, which is in fact, um, one of the gold standards that's been recommended by the Canadian Best Practice Guidelines as we saw in um, day one. So this is a tool that was developed by uh, Schickenberg and colleagues um, way in the 1980s. And so um, this is uh, an image of the tool where there are a total of 20 lines, but in fact, there's 18 lines that the client has to cross out. Uh, the top and the bottom are actually, um, the, the top line here where it says top um, is actually a practice as well, along with the, the bottom one. And so basically what happens is this is a screening tool for USN. Um, there's the 18, um, whoops, sorry. There's the 18 lines that need to be bisected in the middle. So they just have to, um, bisect or put a line right in the middle of uh, each of the lines. They have five minutes to complete the test. Um, as you can see, this test really assesses the near extra personal space alone. Um, and so, because we're really working within that reaching distance. So as I mentioned, the top and the bottom line are um, really either to ignore, or to use as a demonstration to explain um, what the client needs to do. And um, here is, uh, uh, the transparent overlay that could be used for scoring. So this was developed by um, Stone and colleagues uh, more recently in, uh, in 2019 to really look at what would be a more efficient, quick way um, to, to basically um, score the, the uh, line by section test uh, once it's been completed. And so this is kind of a nice um, transparent overlay that could be that we could print it out uh, on a transparent sheet um, and sort of placed on top of the uh, scoring sheet to really uh, identify and measure the extent of uh, deviation that the client has. So basically, just in a bit more detail, uh, the client is instructed to bisect these 18 horizontal lines. Um, and as you can see from the diagram uh, in the previous slides, um, these horizontal lines, there's in fact three columns. So um, you'll see that um, there's six lines that are, are um, that are there on the right side, six lines on the center and six lines on the left of the sheet. Um, so that's how the lines are actually organized. Um, and uh, essentially they're 200, um, you know, 200 meters, uh, millimeters long and one millimeter uh, in terms of the width of the line. And so they're sort of um, scattered in different positions um, randomly. Uh, there are plenty of variations. Uh, and this is where I wanna kind of address that question that I think came up um, from one of the clinicians is that there are plenty of variations of these lines. You will see that there are 17 horizontal lines as, as you've seen on Stroke Engine. There's also uh, a single line um, that needs to be bisected. Uh, you'll see that there's a series of 10 lines uh, that was you know, uh, published by Ferber uh, and colleagues, and then also uh, three lines, which I'll will I introduce you to uh, when we look at the behavioral and attention test. So there's multiple variations of these um, that have all been also tested in the literature that have been used um, uh, extensively in research. Um, however, what was sort of selected by the best practice guideline, uh, the Canadian best practice guidelines was specifically the one um, uh, developed by um, Schickenberg and colleagues um, from 1980. And so that's the one that that's on the slide. 
Um, and so basically what happens here is that they, there needs to be a deviation of more than six millimeters from the midpoint in order to detect the presence of USN. And if there's also an emission of two or more lines on um, one half of the page, uh, so usually if a person has a right CVA, if you see an emission of two or more lines um, on, the, uh, on one half of the page, that would be also an indication of neglect. So here's generally what we have in terms of psychometric properties. So this tool definitely has strong reliability and validity um, uh, that's been demonstrated in the literature. Um, again, it's not uh, been tested in terms of responsiveness, but when we look at specifically uh, specificity, um, again, Obviously, it's not been tested because it's a, a um, screening tool, but when we look at sensitivity and specificity, um, what we find is that uh, it's found to be uh, highly sensitive to detect the presence of USN. Um, and so there's further testing that definitely needs to be done with the tool uh, as the studies are fairly old, but it has been, um, the scoring procedures have been revised more recently in 2019. In terms of suitability, um, definitely, as you can imagine, um, the client needs to be in a seated position. Um, again, you know, the instructions are very basic. Um, and so, of course, depending on the level of aphasia that the client has, uh, they may or may not be able to understand um, the instructions. So that needs to be considered uh, in terms of, you know, whether the client is, in fact, suitable for this assessment tool. Uh, and again, the client needs to complete the tool themselves, it can't be done by proxy, and they need to be able to hold a pencil in, in a sense to be able to com complete the test. Um, and of course, uh, again, you know, uh, although, you know, their performance on the line by section test could also be, uh, in fact, um, even though it could detect the presence of a neglect, uh, there also needs to be sort of um, a discrimination or, you know, between whether the person has a neglect or a hemianopsia, because of course, someone with hemianopsia may uh, in fact have some uh, difficulty performing on the line bisection test. And so, um, although it may not indicate the presence of neglect, it's important to consider and rule out the presence of a hemianopsia. So th that's pretty much what I want to cover with the line by section test. I don't know if there's any questions before we go and sort of use the tool um, and um, sort of manage the scoring. Any questions that uh, anyone has about the line by section test? Maybe we can check. There we go. Oh, okay. Go ahead, Susan. I'm just gonna. Um, I I do. If you do have a client that has bilateral upper extremity issues, um. Any alternatives to the line bisection test to test for you? Or That's I occasionally it. have that. So, so <laughs> you know, if they've had another stroke, or I have a gentleman with atypical MS and that's had a stroke. So, or it. Yeah. Great question, because this is it. I mean, they really do need to use that pencil, right, to be able yeah. to break that line. And that's where that's this is where the challenge starts to come up across where um, these paper and pencil tasks become limiting, right, yeah. for a client. Um, and we need to think about what are other ways that we can assess for neglect. And so maybe perhaps some of the items from the behavioral inattention test, which we will be looking at later, could perhaps um, that don't have that motor component could help uh, assess for neglect. Of course, there's the MVPT too. But, you know, it's real, the MVPT again. I, I caution using that tool because it's designed to really assess for visual perceptual deficit, and um, again, may not be the best to use for um, neglect. But you know, if you do recurrently see the client ignoring um, the stimulus that's coming on the left, it could again be an indication of neglect. Um, but then, usually, you know, when you start to see that with the MVPT, you kind of want to follow up with. Um, an assessment tool for uh, neglect in that case. So I hope that answers your question. Okay, thanks. Thank you. So we have a question in the chat from the group yeah. that had sent their question earlier. So okay. the form the form on stroke engine is the 17 line version, not the 18 line that you're referring to. So what do we do about that? <laughs> yes, that's an interesting question. Yes. So what do we do about this? Mm -hmm. um, so again, it was it's it's it was one of the versions that had been published at the time um, that was, you know, uh, heavily used in research. And so that was posted on stroke engine. But mind you, um, you know, if we really look at the uh, so again, the scoring procedure is identical. OK, that being said, the scoring procedure is identical. You're still still looking at a six millimeter difference uh, deviation from the center point. 
Um, and uh, so that that's that's one point. However, uh, again, you know, it's it's just additional lines uh, that we have. Um, you know, it, it you know, if we look back to the best practice guidelines and what's been recommended in terms of if we specifically look on the stroke best practice website, they have a list of um, standardized assessments that they've recommended to be used um, in stroke care uh, in rehab. And so if you specifically look at that list and and look at the um, which version of the tool that's been recommended, it's specifically the Schickelenberg's uh, tool that was published in 1980, which is the one that's on the slide with the 18 uh, with 18 lines. So if you actually count the, the lines on the slide, there's in fact 20 lines where the top and the bottom are like sort of um, there for, for demonstration or either to ignore. Um, yeah. So the I wonder other, if we should be emailing the stroke engine to ask if they would yes. consider putting the 18 line one up. Yeah, um, exactly. so I will definitely, so stroke, exactly. Thank you for mentioning that soon. So stroke engine, um, it's currently being managed by the uh, researchers at University of Montreal uh, by Professor Annie Rochette, who is a, a well-known researcher in uh, stroke and stroke. So uh, we, I will definitely, you know, uh, approach her with these more recent studies and let her know that um, so that, you know, the more this, this version along with the um, uh, the scoring template, the transparency that's been uh, revised to sort of speed up the process of scoring, um, you know, could be, uh, or at least a link to that could be posted on Stroke Engine. So that could be, um, that could be updated. Now, um, again, I also want to mention that if we look specifically at, um, so I, I have an image here, actually, this is the, this is, this is the image of um, the, the, the printed out version on Stroke Engine. Um, and you may not be able to see from my uh, from my camera, but what I've done is I've, you know, there's actually, you know, if you look at using the demo, like the first line on top as a demo and the bottom line on top as a, the, the bottom line as a demo, there's, an, it's very similar to um, uh, the original version or Schickelenberg's version. In fact, what they have is they have five lines down the middle. They've got five lines on the right and five lines on the left, right? Um, so if you really want to compare the two tools and if you use the top line as a demo and the bottom line as a demo, it's very similar. Now, um, you know, so really, uh, you know, at the end of the day, um, and as you can see, um, the behavioral inattention test, which is a validated tool, also does it differently. Um, you know, and you'll, you will, you know, it's been seen and documented across the, uh, the, the research that uh, there have been different versions of the line by section test. So again, um, you know, my recommendation or my suggestion is, you know, I think as long as you're following um, the correct scoring procedures for the specific tool you're using, uh, I think, you know, that should be fine. Um, and, you know, whether you decide to switch to uh, the specific tool that was, you know, that was um, specifically recommended in that table for the stroke best practice guidelines, that I would leave it to your decision. But I think at the end of the day, you know, these tools have been tested psychometrically um, and uh, it's just, I think what would be important is just how you administer the tool and how you score the tool. And as long as you're following those standardized procedures, I think the tool will in fact detect what it's supposed to detect, so. Okay, thank I don't you. Have any other questions about that? Yeah, there's three questions. So I'll start with the first one. Yeah, it um, is tricky, <laughs> so yeah. If, if okay. we know the person has heavy anopsia, should we avoid the line bisection test? Well, um, well, it's it's been used, in fact, with uh, clients with hemianopsia, but it's it's not meant uh, it's not by all means meant to detect hemianopsia. This is not really what the purpose of that tool is. It's you will see clients with hemianopsia, in fact, have errors on the line by section test or show that they're in fact um, omitting certain sections or lines. You will see, uh, you know, that they have that. But it's essentially this tool has been uh, designed to assess for USN. Okay. So um, there is a, I wonder if the OTs in the Sioux have a question, they're unmuted. And remember, you know, when we look at hemianopsia, it's really a visual, uh, it's a visual um, uh, impairment, right? It's a, it's a visual acuity impairment where, you know, they're not able to see, um, you know, one half of their visual field, right? It's, it's that visual input that's really affected. And so, um, you know, often like an optometrist could be involved in, in really 
if you know if it need be to to really uh, diagnose. Um, but you know it, it's some it's something also that could be looked at as well functionally. Okay. The next question is: Can we enlarge the test if there are visual impairments? Hmm. So this is the thing. So any kind of modifications of a test, it then impacts the validity of the test, right? Uh, or of the uh, administration. And so again, you know, you're if you're, this is where the problem lies. Like, of course they need to be wearing their glasses if they have a pre-existing uh, visual impairment. Um, but technically, you know, when you have a standardized tool, you're not, we're not, you are not, it's not uh, suggested to really modify the tool. Um, right based on that and so that if it's not possible then it's not possible because in fact then it just then the the actual psychometric properties of the tool of the tool in fact become uh void yeah so, right unfortunately no there's one more question again that's if you really want to be <laughs> no i think i think that we would agree with that for sure and again, you know, what we need to consider is sometimes clients aren't appropriate for that standardized assessment, and that's okay. This is where we use our clinical reasoning. This is where we use uh, our functional uh, observation and assessment or evaluation when we're when we're what when we're observing clients and during ADLs and IADLs, uh, where we can then you know make those uh, judgments using maybe more um, less objective, maybe more subjective skills. Mm -hmm. yeah. Okay. Final question. Is there a cutoff score for the line bisection test? We often find someone will get one line off by six millimeters, which means they fail the screen. The other thing we often see is patients having bisections to the right and to the left. And in that case, it wouldn't be indicating USN, but something else which makes it difficult to interpret. Mm, good, great questions. So, okay, so let me address the, I'll sort of go one by one. Is there a cutoff? Mm -hmm. Basically, it's essentially what I had just mentioned. So if they have a deviation of more than six, uh, oops, it's really that. If they if they deviate uh, a line um, of more than six uh, millimeters uh, from the midpoint, it's really indicative of USN. Uh, and then of course, if they emit a line, it's USN as well. So that's really what the guidance is on, uh, according to you know these two authors now um that being said so so that's 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 for the cutoff um and again once these once these tools are sort of indicate the presence of USN you're again then, then I think you know that one thing is to assess the second thing is to really see the impact that this has on function and so that's where we want to kind of you know, observe a client as well and see how um, how this affects them functionally. Now, when we, um, and, and of course, if we see that there's a, um, you know, there's a deviation on the line by section test, we may then decide to choose, you know, because remember the line by section test is not a very, um, uh, detailed assessment, right? And we, when we look, we talked earlier about the difference between assessment tools and screening tools. This is really a screen. So this is just for us to indicate that there could be an issue, right? Mm -hmm. That we need to then follow up with an assessment tool. And th that assessment tool is where we're going to find out, you know, does this client, you know, what's the extent of their neglect? Is it very mild? Is it more moderate or severe? And we can really tease out uh, whether they're, you know, whether they're, um, uh, uh, the extent of their neglect, right? But this tool is sort of a quick and dirty way to find that out. Um, now, if someone, so that's the answer for the six millimeter, right? Uh, and I, I, but I do understand that it could be frustrating. And then, and then we have bisections uh, to the right and to the left. Uh, so what you mean, just maybe, maybe I have to clarify. What you mean is that um, they forget to bisect the right and left, or they're it's not as uh, accurate. Can you guys unmute? Are you able? This is, uh, I believe, in Stratford, our friends from Stratford. Oh, okay. The The bisections are to the right and to oh. the left. So I, I'm assuming either um, the lines are there to the right and the left, but they're not, uh, they're, they, they're deviated more than six millimeters and um, they're, or they're, oh yes, they're deviated. Okay. So, so in that case, when that happens, um, you know, it's more perhaps indicative of a, sort of an, in it, again, I don't want to use the word inattention because then, you know, that's all sometimes jumbled up with neglect, but it's more of an attentional problem, right? Than a, than a, than an actual um, uh, unilateral spatial neglect. It could be that um, they have decreased attention or concentration. And so that could, you know, be more indicative of that as opposed to an actual unilateral spatial neglect or a visual perceptual processing issue. 
So that hopefully that, yeah. Yeah, that's helpful. Okay. Um, I just want to remind people to check the chat. I do put questions if I have specific questions to groups in the chat. And so you can respond to me. Okay. So uh, let's move on to the um, yeah. city. Um, so basically what you're going to do is, uh, and okay, and just also as a preamble, uh, I know I, I really encourage your questions because this is what we're here for. We're here to learn. I, I want to, uh, you know, I want to address as many of your questions as I can, or all of them actually. And so I really invite you either to unmute or if you can't, uh, no problem, uh, put in the chat, whatever way you can share your questions, email, please do so. Uh, we're going to try to get through these slides, I, but I have to say I have a lot of content and I have, I'm not going to go through all of the assessments that I've added in these slides because uh, my idea was to go on through the main ones. I've left a lot of resources for you to take a look at, um, but I wanted, there's some things I do want to go through. If we don't finish, you know, within the two hours, I will take part of the next session to just to finish up quickly. Um, but I really just want to make sure that you really leave uh, learning what you want to learn, uh, you know, from these sessions. So I will try my best. Um, uh, but anyway, let's move forward with this task. Uh, so basically you're gonna go to your breakout rooms. Um, I would like maybe roughly two, you could, it could be more people per, per room, it doesn't matter. Um, the idea is that you're gonna review this case of a client um, with a potential, with, with uh, certain clinical cues that you sort of, you know, have a, an inkling that they may have a presence of neglect, you're not too sure. So then you use, I would like you to um, use the, the file that's labeled as uh, line by section test breakout room. Um, where each member can complete the uh, line by section test based on, so each member can actually complete it based on the cues of the, of the that are being presented in the case vignette. Uh, again, so you know, basically, essentially, what do you what do you think you would see if you have a client uh, in this case? What do you think you would see uh, in terms of results on their line by section test? And so you would just pretty much simulate that um, and and create those hypothetical responses, and then compare you know what you got in terms of scoring. Um, and your thoughts about the tool, and then we'll quickly come back and discuss it again uh, as a larger group, okay? So I will leave you, uh, I'll give you just five minutes for this activity and um, any questions before we break up. I hope that everybody has um, got the uh, handouts I sent to everyone and you'll find the, those two things that um, Anita was describing. If not, just message me in the chat and I'll see what I can send to you. I've assigned you to rooms. If there's a problem, just let me know. I'm just gonna open all the rooms and we'll see how that goes. We could even put it in the chat if need be, um, like the document, but uh, oh, yeah. Okay. okay. Okay, great. Hi everyone. So um, welcome back. Any questions? So how do they go with the uh, line by section test or, or um, you know, uh, I think a few of you, uh, hopefully you had a chance to complete it. Um, and I just wanted to know if you had any questions. I, I also wanted to just, I had it in between discussions as you were in the breakout rooms um, with, uh, I think it was with Jen. And so I will, uh, I'd like to just sort of share that with you um, along with, uh, there was a, also another question in the chat that I had seen about uh, optometrists. And so I'll address that as well. Um, so how did it go? Any questions that you had? That, so what what were the observations that you made in terms of um, the line by section test with this particular client? Um, what would you be expecting to see? Yeah, Krista? I think Krista. Yeah, so I'm not sure if we were on the right track, but we just were expecting that um, like, like they wouldn't see the the whole left side and then it would be sort of half of on the right side and we even thought we could stick this into a plastic sleeve and just trace because we noticed that the marking doesn't it doesn't actually line up it's not the same size okay so we could just slip the original into a plastic sleeve and use a black marker and just trace exactly and then measure exactly halfway and we'd have our own tool we could bring a ruler and it would be pretty easy to use yeah so, so like i have to uh, a disclaimer like the the um what i had sent you in terms of a pdf document was from um the article that was published by stone and colleagues where they they created that that temp the um the overlay the transparent overlay and so uh, of course i was able to take a, a an image and then put it on the slide but of course these slides it's not going to be to scale because like 
I'd have to reduce or increase the limit the the the, uh, the image. So um, of course, you know, with any like with any measure, like the, ideally you, you the uh, the original would be purchased, right? And then you would be able to then photocopy. Uh, you would have the transparent overlay, and then you could also make copies of that just to make sure that you sort of um, uh, respect the um, the size, right? And so that the scoring gets is is valid. So of course, because if you just take the image uh, as I had done onto my slide, it, it may not be representative of exactly what it looks like, right? So so maybe that's why I didn't line up exactly. Is that what you were experiencing? That the scoring sheet did not line exactly with the uh, the testing sheet, right? Yeah. Is it hard to purchase these tests? Like, do they make you go through all the training, how to use it? Do you know? No. No, no, you this can could be purchased on uh, Pearson. I can send you the link. Um, okay. Uh, Pearson, um, I'm not sure what the tool I have. To, I'll, I'll send you the link in the chat um, shortly, or I'll even send an email to Sue with the uh, the links to the for each of the assessment tools. It's actually maybe even in my, if I could go back, I think I had it. No, 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 Stroke Engines. Yeah, on Stroke Engine, you'll see a link to Pearson um, of where to buy the tool. So um, yeah, so if you go directly onto that link, you'll be able to then select line by section. And again, get the, um, but that that transparent testing outlet, that one is, uh, I have to see if that would be available on the on the Pearson website because that, well, that was something that was recently developed. Um, I'm not so sure about that. But anyway, um, this way, at least like when you're using the, the testing sheet uh, and you're measuring the six millimeter, um, uh, deviation, you're sure that it's you're using the right size paper for the test. Um, yeah, Erica. Oh, sorry, I had forgotten to unmute my computer and you're hearing my dog. <laughs> I'm so sorry. <laughs> okay. That's okay. So uh, there is another comment. Um, yes. Go one ahead. They felt the transparent overlay was extremely helpful, more efficient, and accurate scoring, they felt. Yeah. Yeah, and so that's why I'm hoping that, you know, that that overlay would be available if with the purchase of that tool. Uh, but again, you know, this is something that was developed in 2019, um, you know, and I would definitely want to, you know, like I think it would be a good idea to contact those authors to see um, whether that overlay could be provided, right? So, uh, but I've definitely included the reference to that uh, to that article and you you can take a look, it's, it's open access, that article. And so you can read a bit more about um, the overlay and and sort of uh, and what what they found interestingly in that in when they developed the overlay is that they they tested for its reliability um, either both uh, inter rater and uh, intra rater so between different raters and uh, between the same person uh, using the tool and it was found to have um, a very uh, you know equivalent like or very similar uh, reliability as the original without the uh, scoring overlay so um, you know so it just definitely facilitates the whole process for the person. Um, so I think it's very, it would be very useful. The other thing I want to mention is that uh, Jen brought up a really a very important point. Um, as you see on the slides, the instructions that um, the line by section test is presented on a, 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 a3 sheet of paper or a3 size paper, right? So a3, in fact, is, is a little larger than the standard size paper. Um, uh, and so you'll see often in, in tests that are purchased, um, it, it's sort of presented on a very large paper, and I'm going to show you the line by uh, the behavioral inattention test later on. You'll see it's huge. Okay, it's like a big poster, which is why I couldn't photocopy a lot of the pages. And in fact, the the actual testing, um, the part, the the actual uh, the image or the lines, whatever it may be, is actually able to fit on an eight and a half by eleven page, right? But for some reason, they've presented it in a lot much larger paper because they've got the borders all around it. Um, but if you purchase the original uh, version of these documents, you can then photocopy it on an eight and a half by 11 um, and it'll still fit. It's just that, you know, they've got this huge border that goes around that makes the testing material much larger and also often maybe not even easy to carry around. So like the line, the behavioral inattention test comes in this big briefcase, like our bag um, and could, could probably be better suited if it was in a smaller piece of paper. So anyway, that's just that. Um, but you know, in terms of photocopying, you can you can proceed and photocopy them on an eight and a half by eleven. But you definitely want to make sure that you respect uh, the size, the original size of these documents, because when you do measure that deviation, um, you know that six millimeter. If you start to 
try to enlarge things or shrink things, it will affect the scoring procedures, it affects the validity of the test. So that, that's something that cannot be done. So, okay. So let's move on. So thank you for doing that. This is just a video, you know, you could take a look on your own, an example of a, of a left USN, but again, very similar to what you had responded to, where you will really see them crossing um, the lines um, here. You know, we see it, uh, not sure, looking at which side, but if it's a, a right CVA, you're gonna see them um, omitting the uh, left side. So this looks pretty much like what you had to try to, uh, what you had just done in the, um, in the breakout rooms where you know the client is really sort of uh, neglecting or ignoring the left space in this video so if you you know i'll encourage you if you want to take a look at it on your own um later on we had one more question that we forgot oh, yeah. to yeah. Okay. highlight about the role of the optometrist did you see oh, yes, that yes. question yeah. Okay, so the optometrist. John, uh, about, hoping to clarify the role of the optometrist ophthalmologist versus the rehab IHPs in terms of assessments. You hinted the optometrist could diagnose hemianopsia, but how much do the optometrist ophthalmologist delve into these yeah. methods? Great question, because you're not always, you know, depending on where you work, you may not have an optometrist available to assess every time there is a, you know, a, a sort of a suspected uh, hemianopsia. It's, sometimes it's something that's, uh, you know, either the, you know, the neurologist will indicate. Uh, so now in this case, um, of course, you know, as you had seen earlier on day one, I had presented you sort of um, different tests. Uh, there was the Bell's test. There was the, um, um, I think it was the, also the uh, uh, Sunnybrook uh, test as well. Um, and so with these tools, these paper uh, and pencil tests, uh, what we saw is that uh, the one way to discriminate between uh, a neglect and a hemianopsia is that when we see um, tools, like when we see somebody who has a hemianopsia, um, well, for sure, one uh, an individual with hemianopsia, if you cue them to scan their left space, they're able to they're able to then scan and actually see their left space. So during the test, you know, if you're if you then try to encourage the individual to scan their left space. Um, and they're able to do so and then, you know, complete the test, uh, that's, that will give you the indication that they in fact do have, um, that they do have a hemianopsia as opposed to a neglect. With someone with neglect, they're really not going to scan their left hemispace, right? Even with cueing, um, they really think that all they've seen is pretty much all there is. And uh, they really, they really ignore that left space, right? Um, it's because they're just trusting whatever the information their eyes is giving them. With hemianopsia, on the other hand, you're able to cue them to scan that that uh, neglected side. And so that's where you're gonna be able to then discriminate. Of course, like I presented on day one as well, that um, we'll see you know, individuals with hemianopsia have that very um, you know, sort of organized search pattern, whereas somebody with um, uh, USN does has a more disorganized way of searching uh, for the target. So if you present them with a star cancellation test, you know, they're gonna be scanning the page uh, someone with hemianopsia will be scanning the page, this page more organized and in a more organized fashion. Um, also, somebody with USN, um, when there's lots of distractors, uh, they may perform, uh, you know, they may have a certain performance, say, on a line by section test, but then perform more poorly on a, uh, a test like the SAR cancellation where there's more distractors, whereas someone with hemianopsia, that's not the case. They really just ignore, or they not ignore, but rather they, only, they really omit uh, one half of their. Um, their visual field, the left space. So hopefully that clarifies just different ways that you can kind of observe clients when they do um, these paper and pencil tasks and sort of gather more information as to, is it a neglect or is it a hemianopsia? So uh, there is another comment, um, reply to that question from Rosalind that people can read in the chat. And Karen, did you want to say something? Yeah. Um, I just wanted to say, I mean, with... So with the way that this is scored, um, like on the information that you provided, it basically says a deviation of more than six millimeters from the midpoint is USN. Yeah. But it doesn't say like, what if there's only one of those? I mean, this probably never clinically happened, but what if that was only once in the whole test? Like there's no numbers to say, like, is it 50%, 25%, 20%, like, you know what I mean? Of the lines, how many of the lines? It's really one of the lines, uh, but the thing is that, you know, this is where you're going to then kind of use the, your, you know, you're, you're going to then choose, you know, to say, 
I might decide at this point, you know, to use an assessment for us and to really, you know, really investigate this further, right? Um, and so you might then decide to do that, or you might also then observe them during functional activities to see, you know, do they have the presence of a neglect either in their personal space near or far extra personal space during their functional activities and see if that if that transpires there. So you might want to follow with more testing, you know, if you see that, like you say, that occasion where they, they deviate in, on one line, but not on the others, but that's very unlikely, right, if they if they have a true neglect. Yeah, it's just, uh, yeah, okay, that, that clarifies it. Thank you. Yeah. Little time check, 12.07. Okay, so, um, and then just to, you know, so that's, ho hopefully that clarifies with the optometrist. Of course, the optometrist would be uh, ideal to really screen for hemianopsia, but, you know, that's not something that we often have um, uh, available to us. And so that then, you know, these are just ways that you could use the tools that you like that an OT or a health professional will typically administer um, to really kind of, you know, sort of distinguish whether it's really a true USN or a hemianopsia, um, depending on what the client has and the way they present, the way it presents itself on those paper and pencil tests. So hopefully that addresses, I'm just trying to see if there's anything, if there's anything else, please let me know. So um, the Bell's test, I'm not going to go through this, so I'll leave this uh, to you, but it's another test again with the distractors where you have to cross out the, the bells on the page. And um, so here's the whole scoring procedure. And um, again, you know, these are, this is just the overlay that helps you really, so, you know, when you purchase the tool, you have the, the copy of the actual uh, test and you have the overlay, transparent overlay that comes with it that really helps you quickly, um, you know, assess to see whether they actually emitted all the, um, the, the bells. And then in terms of um, sector metric properties, again, it hasn't been tested for reliability, but it does have some signs of uh, validity. So it definitely is a, a tool that's commonly used in clinical practice, but does need to, you know, it needs further testing in terms of reliability and validity for sure. And um, although it does have some evidence of validity, and um, what we can see is that, again, it, it's, it, is, it is one of the tests that are used to, uh, to assess for USN. But what we see with USN is that given that, you know, clients poorly perform when there's multiple distractors, this is really not your number, it's not the, your first tool of choice when you're going to try to screen for USN, um, which is why like the line by section has been the one that's been recommended because of that feature. So I'll go through here. Uh, I want to just quickly introduce you to the apples test. Um, this is really a test that could be used, a cancellation test that could be used to deter determine whether the client has um, egocentric or allocentric um, neglect. And so uh, basically it, the client's presented with uh, apples on a page that they have to cross out. Again, a very similar task. Um, and I've given you a link uh, where you can see the copy of a test, the administration of scoring procedures. Um, but it's essentially looks like this. And so what we'll see with a client is that, um, you know, uh, a client with egocentric neglect will really neglect or really uh, omit to cross the apples um, on the, um, uh, the complete apples on the, um, on the left side of the page. And um, somebody with allocentric um, neglect will omit apples on both the left and right side of the page. Um, and, you know, sometimes even the ones like on the, um, on the, on the left side of the page, you know, where the object, the, the apples are not completed is the ones that they start to neglect. Um, cause you know, they're really truly neglecting, um, the ones that are not completed. So that's sort of what they, whoops, uh, what they do. So this test again, can discriminate between the two different types of neglect, allocentric and egocentric, and, um, is quite useful for that. And it again has like, they have to, again, cross out the full apples, um, and so, you know, when the apples are not complete, sometimes they miss that out if they have the allocentric neglect. So um, that's what we see here. And so this is just more details about the scoring procedure, but I'll just leave that to you uh, to take a quick look at. And if we have more time, we'll kind of, we'll go by, we'll go review them as well. So now I'm going to move on to the um, visual perception uh, assessment, uh, as well as how do we assess for USN. So we have the MVPT, uh, which is a, another assessment tool uh, that we have available um, that's been commonly used in clinical practice. There's different versions of the MVPT, um, the more recent, the MVPT3, um, that can be used. And so I'll just uh, go through here. 
Um, so what, the way this tool works is that it essentially is, um, there's like black and white images that the client needs to, to sort of take a look at. And, uh, and then they answer specific questions. So they have, a, a res they have various response options that are presented on a separate page. And then they have to sort of select the right one that that matches. Um, and so there's very clear, there's a clear script that's provided to uh, clients as to what they need to do uh, in each of the tasks. Um, and um, they essentially just need to follow the instructions and then um, indicate uh, the response that they, they've chosen, either A, B, C, or D. So they could verbally provide their response or they could point to it. Um, so this is where, again, Clients can, uh, or they can, you know, write down their response if they have to. Um, this is where, like, there's that also that uh, there's no motor that's required with this task, as you can see, and it could be sort of adapted uh, based on, you know, the way the client can provide their response. Um, the important thing with the with the uh, MVPT is that um, you know the the examiner really needs to sort of not provide any feedback to the client on their performance because they can often find that it, it's quite a challenging ta uh, test to perform, and so um, you know clients might ask if they're doing well or how things are going, and so um, or they may feel that they're not they're not really sure. Uh, which response to select, you know, they may be, they may be uh, hesitant between two and they just really don't know. And they don't, you know, they just say, I don't know. And I, they don't seem to provide you with a, a response. And so you really want to encourage the client to provide a response to each of the questions uh, as much as possible. And so what you do at the end is that each, um, after each uh, uh, item or uh, yeah, after each um, stimulus is presented and responses are obtained, um, you write it down on the scoring sheet, and um, you'll be you'll see what the correct uh, answers are, and so you'll be able to basically um, generate a raw score uh, based on their performance of how many uh, answers that they got correct, um, and then you'll be able to convert that raw score into a standard score um, using the um, uh, they have various different uh, normative data that you can use to find out what that standard score is, and then. You can then, depending on the age that you're working with, so if it's pediatrics, but here we're working with adults, um, but you know when this tool is used with a pediatric population, you can get age equivalents. Um, but what's what's useful is to look at the, also the percentile per, percentile ranks um, that have been found with normative data. So really comparing them to the, you know, uh, and really seeing what percentile that they rank in comp comparing to healthy adults or healthy elderly uh, in the same age category. So that's what could be that's something that could be done. Uh, in a more quantitative fashion to really document um, the level of visual uh, visual perception and impairment that the client has. So this is kind of what the tool looks like. Um, these are just some, some of the stimulus and where they have to choose um, uh, one of their responses, A, B, C, or D. And um, across the different versions, um, the MVPT3 being the most recent, uh, there's been quite a bit of um, updates that have been done. Um, they've really increased the difficulty uh, from the original MVPT to the MVPT3. So that's really what the difference is. There has been an increase in the number of items. Um, they're still assessing the same uh, constructs. So discrimination, figure ground, memory, closure, and spatial. So if you have a different version, if you've got the original versus the MVPT3, um, the, the, you know, that's just something to keep in mind is that um, the ones that the MVPT has, it's more difficult, uh, it has a higher level of difficulty. And so, um, you know, would be a more appropriate tool to use for screening for things like driving, for instance. Um, so uh, in terms of scoring procedure, again, uh, it's just quickly highlighted here on the table, but we can look at that in more detail later. Um, and really the idea is to determine what the raw score is and convert it into a standard score and percentile rank using uh, the normative data tables that you have in the manual. Um, and it takes roughly 20 to 30 minutes to administer um, the MVPT3 taking more time than before because of uh, an increased number of items. And uh, but the scoring is not too bad. It's about 10 minutes long. Uh, in terms of reliability and validity, just here, just summarizing all the information here, um, it's been tested quite extensively um, and it's found to have a moderate, it's found to be predictive of driving ability post strokes. So, um, again, you know, you, it could definitely be a tool that's used for driving, um, assessing driving. However, you know, this area is uh, often an area where uh, sort of an area of specialty when it comes to OT in terms of driving assessment and screening. And so, um, you know, 
you know, these tools could be done, but then I would definitely uh, refer the client to a, to a therapist who specializes in stroke and drives driving screening to really, you know, determine uh, fitness to drive. Cause that is really another area of specialty that requires um, a bit more training. Actually, McGill University also offers a course on, um, you know, driving, driving screening and assessment, uh, if you would like to become a, um, a certified therapist, but uh, it's really an, a very specific or niche or area of practice um, that that needs to be uh, that requires training. Uh, so that this is just general information about the reliability and validity, but pretty, uh, it's pretty, uh, has been found to be reliable and valid, um, but the MBPT3 could benefit from more validity testing. Uh, in terms of, again, in terms of suitability, we need to keep in mind the client does need to be in an upright position. The test is lengthy. It may need to be done across two sessions, given that it you know, does require some level of endurance. Um, fortunately, there's a very limited or little language requirement for this test. And so uh, it could be done, uh, you know, even, as long as they can uh, understand very basic instructions, um, but that there's no motor component specifically that's needed for this tool uh, in order to write, which is very different uh, than the other paper and pencil tests that we've seen. Um, another good alternative that you know I will just mention on the side is the Rivermead perceptual assessment battery, um, but it also again does require a lengthy administration time as well. So um, that's pretty much what I wanted to mention about the MVPT. Any um, any questions about the MVPT in general, or could we proceed to the um, to the activity? I don't know if uh, this is. I'll just put the activity up here. But there uh, was a quick question. Let me just sure. see if I can find it. Um, it's really about the Apple cancellation test. I don't know if you want to do that now or. She wanted to know what we can expect for allocentric neglect. Oh, for egocentric, uh, oh, sorry, where did I see? Allocentric question? neglect. Oh, okay. For for allocentric neglect, what would we expect to see? Well, On the apple okay. cancellation, yeah. Yeah, so in the apple cancellation test, what we're gonna see is that, um, that, that clients will, um, uh, when they have an allocentric neglect, they will, um, not only are they going to be, they're, they're going to be actually, um, wait, let me just go back to the image very quickly because it might help. Okay, so what we see with the allocentric neglect is that, and again, if we remember the definition for allocentric neglect, it's where they, uh, they neglect like one half of each uh, like of their, uh, of whatever they're visualizing, right? Either in their right or their left hemispace. So it really doesn't matter where um, the visual stimuli is being presented. So if it's an apple, they'll see half of the apple uh, on their right side of the field, as well as their left side of the field, right? Whereas your typical neglect, which is egocentric neglect, is where, you know, they'll, they'll uh, be able to see the full apples on the right side, but on the left side, they're not, they're gonna be emitting you know, the full apples completely, right? It doesn't matter how it's presented, right? They're just gonna be, they're gonna be emitting the full apples. They're gonna be just emitting a lot of the, a, a lot of the, um, um, the stimuli on the, uh, on the apple says everything that's presented on the left side is gonna be emitted. So I don't know if that clarifies uh, your question. Hopefully. See if they type it in the chat or unmute. What about allocentric? She's asking. Yeah, so allocentric is where um, in allocentric you're going to see them emitting, um, you know, so e even objects on the right side. Um, so they're going to be they're going to be uh, omitting objects on the on the right and the left side. But what's going to be happening is that um, the, you see the objects that have the uh, the person. So for instance, if they have left allocentric neglect. Um, they're going to be the images that have like that little gap, as you can see, you, you, you know, it's not a full apple, right? Like it's, it's sort of missing a part. They're going to be, they're not going to realize that and they're going to cancel that. Okay. Is that good, Emily? Does that make sense? They're yeah. Not gonna be, they're not going to be able to discriminate that. Thank also. you. Yeah. Okay. Good. So that's sort of how, you know, if we want to sort of get, 
a little bit more information in addition to the neglect. You know, so this tool could be useful actually, in fact, to assess for neglect. So you could just use this tool, uh, you know, to assess for neglect, but to also further discriminate whether there could be a possibility of an allocentric or allocentric neglect as well, um, which is why this tool could be useful for that. So, um, So here we are with the uh, MVP team. So um, I'd like to give you um, 10 minutes for this activity. Essentially what you're gonna be doing is um, you'll be, uh, so one second, yeah. So basically you're gonna, you're gonna sort of assume a role. So there's gonna be an examiner role and a client role. And so um, we'll give you, let's see how we are for time. Okay, so we'll give you 10 minutes for this activity where you're gonna be essentially, um, one person will be reading the script and presenting the stimuli and the other, the client will be um, either writing or typing their responses. So I've sort of indicated which files to open depending on which roles you have assigned. So if you're the examiner, you're gonna open up this file, you're gonna read the script to the client. And then if you're the client, you're gonna be uh, indicating your responses on the Word doc, okay? And um, and then after that, at the end, the examiner and the client will sort of look together at the responses and look at the MVPT answer document and see, you know, did you get the correct responses? Okay, so um, so just this is just to quickly, you know, see uh, if you have any questions in terms of administering and scoring the uh, MVPT, um, and then. Um, so this, I would say, task one is really for those who are not familiar with the MVPT. Of course, if you administer this tool at exhaustion, I would, you know, you could skip that task one and you could kind of jump to task two where you're basically trying to find the standard score and percentile rank if you haven't, uh, you know, um, if you don't commonly do that with your clients, uh, you know, once they've uh, completed the test, um, just to kind of brush up on how to score uh, the actual, um, how to obtain the standard score and percentile rank uh, using the manual. So you could look at the MVPT John Doe document to just um, review how to score the um, the standard score and percentile rank. Um, and if you really are feeling that this is, you know, you don't wanna sort of engage in those two tasks because you have a lot of experience in MVPT, no worries, but maybe you can just use that time to discuss amongst your colleagues in that group about um, any issues in terms of scoring, clinical applicability, um, the strengths and weakness of this tool and your perception of it. So, um, so here are the tasks, I will give you 10 minutes. And um, and then you can proceed ahead. And so hopefully, if you have any questions, feel free to reach out. Yeah. So there is a question in the chat. We can do it yeah. afterwards if you'd like. And I'll okay. open all the rooms. Sounds good. I'll put my timer on. Okay. Okay. Great. So um, any thoughts of whoops? Any thoughts about uh, the MVPT in terms of uh, scoring administration? What were your experiences? Um, you know, I, I had just kind of given a sample for those who maybe aren't so familiar with the MVPT to kind of get a peek at what it looks like, what it's like to score. Um, what were your thoughts? Uh, maybe we could start with the first task about just for those of you who tried out the MVPT, any 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 thoughts? Oh, okay, go ahead. I think, uh, Karine, yeah, you... go ahead. Okay, uh, yeah, we just were, were noticing like how much focus it requires and attention and we were kind of thinking is it still a reliable valid test if it's broken up into two separate sessions or do you have to do it all at one time because it's it seems like at one point or another it could be more the attention and focus that's the problem not the actual perceptual abilities so yeah. just well, wonder what your thoughts are on that yeah i mean of course you know that this is the thing like uh you know if you're, if you're going to get the client to uh to do ideally in, in testing situations you want the client to do the entire test in that one 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 shot right now you as you know clinically you have to be careful of watching the client in terms of their level of endurance because of course that could impact their performance more so than the actual impairment right that you're assessing and so you want to be careful that you that it's not because they're not able to maintain that seated position uh or they have attentional issues that are not related to their visual perception that are causing them to kind of, you know, need to sort of take a break, right? So you you do need to keep a, you need to be mindful of that as you're assessing to determine whether you're going to 
you know, take breaks or end it and then re resume with the next session. But it's often, it is often the case where therapists will, like especially in inpatient rehab, start the test, uh, do half of it, and then do the other half at the next time. Uh, because it is quite onerous uh, for the patient, especially uh, post-stroke. I don't know if others share that same experience or feelings or uh, what are your thoughts on that? But it, it's it, because in the end, if you get the client to continue performing the test, or if you get the client to continue the test, you're still not going to get valid responses uh, simply because they're tired or simply because they are they can't pay attention anymore, right? So that's a it's a, it's a concern. And you want to make sure that uh, when you're assessing for true visual perception, that you're actually able to capture the extent of this impairment, right? So, but great. There's great another question, question, Anita. Yeah. Karen, did you want to follow up first? I uh, just want to say thanks. Yeah. <laughs> okay. okay. Thank you. Uh, the OTs in Sault Ste. Marie are asking if there's a time limit for how long you give people to answer each question on the MVPT. Mm, that's a good question. I don't. I I don't see anything in the in the manual. I didn't see anything in terms of time limit. Um, you know, they're they're able to reflect on their answer. I think you're able to also uh, you know repeat the question. <clears throat> But at some point, they have to actually come up with their response, and and it's even indicated that if they say I don't know, you know, you you do really need to wait for their response. Um, so again, this is where you're going to have to sort of gauge um, the level of attention, and, and then you know how long they can kind of sit and complete the test to know when to take a break. But um, yeah, there's no specific time that's been indicated in the manual for that. Okay, it's so another question from another group. In their yeah. experience administering the MBPT with several clients over the years, breaking it up is definitely required sometimes. I'd usually stop at the end of a section and start with a new section for the second half. So that's how they used it functionally. Yeah, great, I, great suggestion because um, I, I've given you a sample in the um, when you had in the breakout rooms of, of the different types of um, scripts, uh, instructions, and um, testing material. But like you'll see that it changes across each. Um, uh, section and so um, that's a great suggestion to sort of break when you have a change in the in, in your section yeah okay. and then another person has said that they've been hesitant to use the MVPT4 in driving screens as we find it's much more difficult compared to the original MVPT do you have any thoughts on this yeah so you mean between using the um, the MVPT3 and the uh, MVPT original the MVPT4 Oh, the four. Yeah. So the four is very similar to the three. It's just a, a revised version. Uh, and what you're saying, sorry, just to clarify your question, is it that you, you see a difference between the MVPT four and the three or the original? The original. Oh, yes. Okay. So the, of course, the original, in fact, if you look at the table with the psychometric testing, it was done on the original. Um, the MVPT four, three and four include more items <clears throat> and items that are increased level of difficulty, but Again, this, they haven't redone their testing for psychometric properties, but in fact, we do know that the MVPT three and four are, how do you say, a greater level of difficulty and might, how do you say, discriminate between, or, or may, may be stronger as a predictor for, for driving. And again, this is, has not been tested. So this is just my, my um, subjective opinion. My subjective opinion, but but yeah. if you look specifically at what in terms of the articles, like they really were involving the original MVPT. So uh I, I you know I don't I wouldn't throw out the, the original. I would keep it for the uh driver testing because it has been validated um as a screen. But again that's only step one for driving, right? Like there's other parts right. of it as well. So yeah. But you um, know, I, I would continue to use the original if you feel like it's easier. Another one is saying that she believes the MVPT4 is in the Canadian Stroke Best Practice Guidelines 2019, and it takes a long time to administer. They can get seven answers wrong, not in the same section. I haven't used the original or the three as our team uses the four. So that's just what's happening somewhere else. Yeah, no, that's great. Like, it's great to know. I mean, the, between the three and four, they're very similar. Um, it's just that uh, the, the, the four has been has really improved in terms of its uh, the way it's presenting the information and, and uh, essentially that, but it hasn't really changed in terms of testing items. But um, but yeah, there's a big difference between the the original and the uh, and the four. Yeah. So and, and the four has been recommended. The more recent version has been recommended in the guidelines. However, if you're using the three, it, it would be similar. Right, but it's still 
you know, they tend to be using the original when they're screening for driving. So they might want to consider moving to three or even four. Yeah, even absolutely. It's more difficult. Yeah. There's another question about the MVPT. Yeah. Would you prefer the MVPT test versus what we do at our clinics, which is trails A and B for driving screens? Mm. Trails A and B also have been validated and it's been an indicator for dr predicting driving. So trails A and B is important to include as well. It's really, uh, the, there's the MVPT, but trail A and B, uh, you know, sort of as a, as a sort of a toolkit to assess for driving. Um, so would you do both? Would you do both? Is that what uh, is being asked? That's what I'm asking. I'm not, it's oh, not. Okay. Right. <laughs> would I do both? Um, I think for driving screening, I definitely would, would aim for doing both. Yeah, um, others are saying in the chat, they do both. Yeah. Because what happens is that MVPT, it assesses really visual perception and uh, the um, constructs that are being assessed for the trail A and B is very different. It's different. It's not yeah. just scanning it's it's divided sustained attention so you're looking at other components that are important for driving so you would essentially do both right there was an earlier question i don't know if this is the time that there was a question about what is the functional implications of egocentric mm -hmm. versus allocentric that's a really good question i mean you know in the literature it's it's they've published the uh, apples test to really discriminate between the two clinically to what what do we see you know in these clients it's very similar to what you would see in neglect, right? It would be very similar. Um, it's just that, you know, they tend to not dress one half of their body or they tend to uh, neglect, um, you know, their spaces uh, in uh, as well in the left, but they um, it still presents as functional limitations that they have in terms of ADL and IADL. You won't particularly see big differences, but it's when you test and see that you can discriminate between whether they have an egocentric and neglect and allocentric. Um, with, with egocentric and neglect, they, you will very clearly see them really for sort of omitting their, their left space. With allocentric, um, they still neglect parts of their left space, but they, um, they're also, you know, sort of, um, you know, uh, parts of their right spaces are also being neglected because in, it's in fact the objects that they're viewing, right? So um, uh, they what, what we'll see clinically, for instance, is that if they have a meal tray with allocentric uh, neglect, you know, they will sort of misjudge, uh, you know, where the coffee cup is placed on their meal tray and they may knock it down, right? Um, and uh, because they don't really see that left half or there's parts of the images that they don't see. Um, so this is where they you start to you still see limitations in terms of function, um, slightly different than you do with uh, egocentric neglect, which is the the typical where really the left half is ignored. Right. That's all for our questions. Great. Okay, so we'll continue forward. Oh, so now we're going to cover. Um, so that's the MVPT. Um, and so now we move on to the uh, U USN behavioral and attention test. And this is really the last test that I will be covering today in, term, in, in a bit more detail, but I will also, as you can see on the slides, um, uh, you'll, or uh, if you have the handouts, you'll see that there are other tests that have been um, included um, because I just wanted to give you, you know, again, extra tools that you might that you might find useful to use in clinical practice. Um, and so what we see with the uh, behavioral and attention test, this has been the tool that's been recommended um, uh, to use uh, by the guidelines, um, the Canadian Stroke Best Practice Guidelines for assessment of USN. And so um, we see that it, uh, it's, it, it could really detect the presence of neglect in everyday activities. Um, there's two uh, parts to it. There's the conventional subtests and behavioral subtests. Um, and there's uh, also a shortened version, but essentially it takes 30 to 40 minutes. Um, it could also uh, really assess for near and far extrapersonal space neglect. Oops. Yeah. So um, I'm going to kind of walk through each of the tools and then I'll try to also give you a visual as to what they look like. So we'll start with the um, conventional subtest. So just move the papers here. And so um, when we look at the conventional subtest, there's the line crossing test, which looks like, let me see, I have to just make sure I can see myself to make sure that I'm showing the right image here. Yeah. So hopefully you can see this. This is what the line crossing test looks like, where they have to cross out all the target lines. Um, I haven't, you know, of course, if you look at the manual, you'll have more details as to what the uh, instructions are, the standardized script. Um, and um, in the next coming slides, you'll see the schooling procedures for each of the tools. So this is the line crossing. The next one is, oh, sorry. 
The next one is the, is the letter cancellation. So this is what the letter cancellation looks like, where they have to scan, locate, and cross out 40 targets. Um, so they have to do the E and the R. And then the next one is the star cancellation test, which we had talked about earlier. So this is what it looks like. Um, again, they have to cancel the small stars. And this is the, the next one is, um, and as you can see, like, this is where things become a bit difficult for the client who's at a, uh, a USN is that, you know, not only do they have to cancel the small stars, but they have all these other distractors that they have to navigate um, in on the image, right? This is the um, figure shape, uh, figure and shape copying test. So this is what the uh, figures look like. <clears throat> and they have to just replicate this drawing um, on the left side of the page. So basically copy it down. And uh, then we've got the line, uh, where is it? The line bisection test. So here's like, again, as I mentioned earlier, it's like three lines that they have to bisect down the middle. <clears throat> and then um, representational drawing. So they basically have to, oh, representational drawing, they essentially have to draw a picture of a clock um, with hands and numbers, a man or a woman and a, a butterfly. So they have to draw images, uh, three drawings. And yeah, okay. And then we have the behavioral subtests. So these look different. So I'll just quickly show you what they look like. So we've got the um, picture scanning. So you'll get like three photographs that they have to view. So here's one photograph uh, of a meal. It's very, it's a little, I look at these images and they're a bit older, but they're hard to figure out. <laughs> Some of the things are hard to figure out. It's a bit, uh, I wonder whether they need to really update these. <laughs> so that's one. Um, this is the second image. Okay. And then the third image here is a room with furniture, okay? And the patient is basically instructed to name or point to main items in the picture. So the items are listed on the scoring sheet. Uh, and then you basically have to read them out to the client and then they have to point to um, the items that they see in the picture. Okay, so that's what the, um, the picture scanning test, uh, picture scanning task is like here. Then we've got telephone dialing. So this is where they have to, um, they use a telephone. So they could use, a, you could provide them with a, um, a telephone with, with numbers or you can they can use their cell phone, but the, or they could actually use a keyboard. Uh, that's another thing that could be provided to the client in order to perform this test. But they basically have to um, dial the number sequence that's presented, okay? So here, and then and, and then you present them with the last one. So there's a series of numbers, and they essentially have to type out the numbers. Like I said, on a uh, if you have a telephone that you can bring with you, or uh, you know they could use their cell phone, or they can try to use uh, a keyboard um, to to indicate these numbers. The next one is the menu reading. So you'll have a a menu with with um, 18 food items that have been uh, listed. And so uh, as you can see, they're gonna, it's gonna require the client to basically scan um, the right and left side of the page in order to, um, they basically have to open the menu and read out the items. And then you, you on your scoring sheet, indicate uh, which items have been, have been, uh, been they, they did not read or were forgotten. Um, and then for article reading, so you've got an article that they actually have to read the text. Um, so they're instructed to read these columns. Um, and so you're wanting to see whether there's a text that they actually are um, omitting or forgetting to read or they don't see um, because they're neglecting it. And then the next one. Oh, sorry. Telling time. So basically, 
represented with a clock like this. And um, there's basically there's um, images that they have to actually, so they first have to read uh, the time from a digital clock. Uh, and uh, so that's presented in a card. And then after that, you ask them to, uh, which is actually here. So this is what the images look like here. So they have like three of them and then they have to basically identify. Yeah, what uh, they have to, they have to basically tell us what time it says on the clock. And then of course they, they are, um, they're required to um, set the time on the anal analog clock uh, indicated by the examiner. And so basically you're gonna tell them, um, uh, well, first you're gonna, you're gonna actually set the time and then they're gonna have to read the time. And then, and then you're gonna give them the time that they have to, them, they themselves have to set on the clock. Okay, so um, what, what you're gonna do is uh, basically the, the times that you actually have to ask them to set is indicated on the scoring sheet. So, uh, so that's sort of what you have to do to that. And then um, address copying. Oh, find the time. Oh yeah. So then the, the coin sorting. Uh, yeah, coin sorting. So coin sorting. Basically, um, there's a there's a board here, uh, and it, this is actually in um, uh, in pounds. <laughs> so as this, this is it's a British test. So. Um, but what they've done is they they basically have indicated spots where you put coins, so you place coins on the board. And um, so you can place different types of coins on the board. So of course you can you can place Canadian money on the board and then you get the client to scan and locate the type of coin that you're telling them to locate. So essentially the same thing and you can just use Canadian monies for that. Um, then the next task is uh, instructing the clients to copy a sentence. So address copying. So you'll so they're provided with the following address, and then they're asked to copy the address. So it's right here, and then same thing. There's like a sentence, um, and they're instructed to copy the sentence. Okay. Then we've got map, map navigation. So map navigation is where um, you're going to be presented with a map like this. And there's like coordinates on the map. There's like letters, A, B, C, D, E, F, G, whatever. And so what they're gonna be doing is um, they basically have to locate um, specific points um, on the path. So they have to explain like how to get uh, from say A to E or, you know, and they have to sort of really uh, sort of draw out a route based on whatever you ask them to do. So, um, and they have to use their fingers to trace out the sequence of the letters um, said by the examiner. So it'll be different coordinates on this uh, on these um, on this network of pathways and they basically have to indicate um, you know which one uh, based on the letters. So that's for map navigation and then card sorting is um, the deck of cards. And again, the cards are presented um, uh, on a on sort of a board on a four by four matrix. Um, so you you basically lay out a uh, very specific card so they, uh, for instance, the first test item is um, like a, a, a 10, 6, queen, and joker. Um, and so you lay out those cards and then the, you just, you um, you present just different types of cards uh, on a four by four matrix. And then you essentially ask the client, okay, indicate which one is the 10, which one's the king, um, where's the uh, queen? And so they have to point to the card, to, to the respective cards, and you basically see if they get it correct or not. So it's really, again, testing their sense of visual scanning across that, that four by four matrix um, of, you know, where you've set out the cards. So, so we have are... two minutes. Sorry? We have oh, two minutes. minutes. Okay. All right. So um, just to quickly, so that's basically the BIT. There's a shorter version um, that you can, you can basically do. And um, for scoring. So I've pretty much laid out the scoring procedure for this test. Um, and uh, so you can see that they basically will, uh, it really indicates what they need to do and how they need to perform, what the cutoffs are. It's very detailed in the next coming slides um, for all the different items. And we have clear cutoff scores as to how they need to perform for the test, okay? 
Uh, and so for each item, um, there's a specific cutoff that, oh, there's an acceptable range, but there's also a cutoff for each item. And then if you look at the total, like all the conventional tests, there's a cutoff for that as well. And all the behavioral tests, once you obtain a total score, there's a cutoff for that as well. So that's what's there uh, that's been published. And then in terms of reliability and validity, of course, they have strong reliability and validity. It's been recommended in the best practice guidelines um, in Canada. So um, you know, we're there, it's a, it's a very well-designed tool to use. Um, however, we have to mention that it hasn't been tested for responsiveness yet, but we do find that it's uh, sensitive and specific to, um, to detect neglect. Um, and so now, uh, of course, lengthy to administer is, is a big issue. Uh, so I see that I have to wrap up, but what we will do then is we'll pick up from, um, this is just another scale, the Catherine Bergego scale. Uh, that's there, but we'll really pick up from here at this point um, uh, in regards to just re reviewing. Um, there's a, there's actually one activity that I would like to complete. Uh, where is it here? Um, with the BIT. Um, so maybe we'll pick up uh, on, on Wednesday on our day three, where we'll just quickly look at the BIT, um, see if you have any questions in terms of administration and scoring. Maybe you can take a look at uh, this on your own. And um, we can be ready to, you know, quickly do the activity and uh, discuss the scoring and your impressions of the tool and any questions that you have. And then we'll move forward with treatment interventions after that. So yeah. I hope that works out. Um, but I really, I enjoyed your questions today. I hope this was informative. Um, I know it's a lot of information. Uh, this probably could have been a full day <laughs> on just assessment, but yeah. um, it's really to give you a snapshot of specifically the tools that have been recommended and best practices. So thank you. Yeah. yeah, it's been really great. Thank you. So we'll, um, I'll put this up on the um, website as a recording. And then once I receive handouts from Anita for day three, I will send those along with the link. I haven't done either of those things yet. And we will see everybody next Wednesday at 11 a.m. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. <laughs>